In this section, we'll look at the bones of the facial skeleton and the part of the skull the facial skeleton is attached to, the base of the cranium. Understanding the bony anatomy of this region will give us a good foundation for understanding some large and important areas of the head and neck. We'll begin by taking an all-around look at the main bony features of the region. Then we'll look at the individual named bones that make up the facial skeleton and the base of the cranium. Lastly, we'll look at the openings in the base of the cranium which some important nerves and blood vessels pass through. The facial skeleton consists of a number of named bones. We'll look at them individually later in this section, but we'll start by looking at the main overall features of the facial skeleton. To simplify the picture, we'll remove the mandible. The cavity for the eye is called the orbital cavity. It's protected on the outside by the thickened orbital margin. The opening for the nose leads to the right and left nasal cavities, which are separated by the nasal septum. The upper jaw, or maxilla, bears the upper teeth. The prominence of the cheekbone leads back to this bony arch, the zygomatic arch. The deepening hollow here is the temporal fossa. It's enclosed by this ridge, the temporal line, by the lateral orbital margin, and by the zygomatic arch. The temporal fossa contains the large temporalis muscle. The temporal fossa is continuous with this deeper hollow, the infratemporal fossa. The walls of the infratemporal fossa are formed by this part of the base of the skull and by the posterior part of the maxilla. The infratemporal fossa contains the pterygoid muscles and also this part of the mandible, the coronoid process. On the underside of the skull, we come to structures that we've seen already. Here's the foramen magnum, the basilar part of the occipital bone, and the petrous part of the temporal bone. Two thin sheets of bone project down from the base of the skull behind the maxilla. They're the pterygoid plates, lateral and medial. Between the two medial pterygoid plates are the posterior openings of the nasal cavities, the posterior nares, or coeni. The hard palate forms the roof of the mouth and the floor of the nasal cavities. Here inside the nasal cavities are the conchi, or turbinate bones. We'll look inside the nasal cavity in the next section. The posterior nares open into the nasopharynx, which lies in the space between the medial pterygoid plates the base of the occiput, and the anterior arch of the atlas vertebra. In a minute, we'll look at the individual named bones that form the facial skeleton. Before we do that, we need to take a look at some of the features of the inside of the skull. This special skull has been cut away at a series of levels that are just above the floor of the cranium. The way it's been cut reflects the fact that there are two big steps in the floor of the cranium, formed by the sphenoid ridges and the petrous temporal bones. These divide the floor of the cranial cavity into three parts, the anterior cranial fossa, the middle cranial fossa, and the posterior cranial fossa. We saw the posterior cranial fossa in the previous section. In this section, we'll look at the main features of the anterior and middle cranial fossae. The bone that forms this upward bulge in the floor of the anterior fossa is the same bone that forms the roof of the orbit. This crest in the midline is called the crista galli. On either side of it is a depression the base of which is formed by these small areas of thin, perforated bone, the cribriform plates. The cribriform plate forms the very narrow roof of the nasal cavity. Here we can see it from below. 
the filaments of the olfactory nerve, which transmits the sense of smell, pass through the openings in the cribriform plate. This flat area behind the cribriform plates is the roof of a cavity that we'll see later, the sphenoid sinus. Now we'll move back to the middle cranial fossa. The bone that forms the side wall and floor of the middle cranial fossa also forms, on the outside of the skull, the wall of the temporal fossa and of the infratemporal fossa. We've seen that this is the roof of the orbit. The bone that forms the anterior wall of the middle temporal fossa also forms part of the orbit. It forms this posterior part of the lateral orbital wall. This complicated raised area in the middle is called the cella tersica. The main features of the cella tersica are this deep depression, the pituitary fossa for the pituitary gland, this shallow groove for the two optic nerves, and these four projections, the anterior and posterior clinoid processes. This sloping surface behind the posterior clinoid processes, the dorsum celli, is continuous with the base of the occiput. The floor of the middle cranial fossa is marked by numerous openings for nerves and blood vessels, which we'll come back to later in this section. Now that we've looked at the shape of the facial skeleton and the parts of the cranium that it's attached to, let's look at the individual facial bones and see how each of them contributes to the features that we've seen. We'll look at the five largest facial bones first. There are the frontal and zygomatic bones, the maxilla, the sphenoid bone, and the ethmoid bone. The frontal bone is a very large bone. The lower part of the frontal bone forms the beginning of the root of the nose, the upper part of the orbital margin, a small part of the temporal fossa, and a large part of the roof of the orbit. The frontal bone also forms most of the floor of the anterior cranial fossa. The part of the frontal bone near the midline is hollow. The hollow space is the frontal sinus, one of the paranasal sinuses, which we'll look at shortly. Next, we'll look at the zygomatic bone. The zygomatic bone forms the bony prominence of the cheek. It also forms the lower lateral part of the orbital margin and this part of the lateral orbital wall. The zygomatic bone extends backward to meet the zygomatic process of the temporal bone, forming the zygomatic arch. Now we'll move forward and look at the maxilla. Here's the maxilla. The right and left maxillae are joined together in the midline. On each side, the maxilla forms the lower medial part of the orbital margin and almost all of the floor of the orbit. The maxilla bears the upper teeth. On the underside, it forms much of the hard palate. The maxilla is hollow. It contains the largest of the paranasal sinuses, the maxillary sinus. To see the posterior part of the maxilla, we'll remove the zygomatic arch. Here's the back of the hollow part of the maxilla. Down here, the maxilla is joined to the bone behind it, the sphenoid bone. Apart from this attachment, the maxilla is separated from the sphenoid by this impressive cleft, which has a vertical part and a horizontal part. The vertical part of the cleft is called the pterygomaxillary fissure. The horizontal part of the cleft is called the inferior orbital fissure. The inferior orbital fissure, here it is from in front, separates the floor of the orbit, formed by the maxilla, from the lateral wall that's formed by the sphenoid. Now we'll move on to look at the sphenoid bone.
The sphenoid bone is extremely complex. It extends all the way from one side of the skull to the other. The sphenoid bone forms important parts of the underside and outside of the skull. And it forms part of the orbit. The sphenoid bone also forms this large and complicated part of the floor of the cranium. Here's a sphenoid bone all by itself. The sphenoid bone has a central part and on each side three major projections, the lesser wing, the greater wing, and the pterygoid process. The central part of the sphenoid includes the clinoid processes and the pituitary fossa. The central part of the sphenoid bone is hollow, as we'll see. The lesser wing, which is the highest part of the sphenoid bone, forms the sphenoid ridge, which separates the anterior and middle cranial fossae. The underside of the lesser wing forms this small but important part of the back of the orbit. The greater wing of the sphenoid forms the front wall and part of the floor of the middle cranial fossa. On the outside, the greater wing forms this part of the temporal and infratemporal fossae. And it also forms this large part of the lateral wall of the orbit. The greater wing and the lesser wing are joined here but more medially they're separated by this triangular gap, the superior orbital fissure, which forms a large opening between the orbit and the inside of the cranium. Here's the superior orbital fissure from the inside. We'll get a better look at it in a minute. The pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone projects downward behind the maxilla. The pterygoid process includes the lateral and medial pterygoid plates, which are the attachments for some important muscles that we'll see later. This hollow between the pterygoid plates is the pterygoid fossa. This little hook is the pterygoid hamulus. It's a pulley, as we'll see later. The last bone on our list of large facial bones is another quite complicated bone the ethmoid. The ethmoid bone is a little hard to understand at first because in the intact skull most of it is hidden from view. The only parts of the ethmoid bone that we can readily see are this small part of the floor of the anterior cranial fossa, the two cribriform plates with the cristigalli in between, and this part in the medial wall of each orbit. It'll be easier to understand the ethmoid bone when we look at the nasal cavity in the next section. Till then, we'll leave the ethmoid bone alone. There are three smaller facial bones that we'll look at briefly, the nasal, lacrimal, and palatine bones. This is the nasal bone. This is the lacrimal bone. The two thin nasal bones form just the upper part of the bridge of the nose. The structural supports for the projecting parts of the nose are made of cartilage, as we'll see later. The little lacrimal bone forms the most medial part of the inferior orbital margin. This opening between the lacrimal bone and the ethmoid bone is for the nasolacrimal duct, which takes tears from the corner of the eye to the nasal cavity. Last of all, we'll look at the palatine bone. Here's the lower part of it. On each side, the palatine bone forms the posterior part of the hard palate and part of the side wall of the nasal cavity. We'll get a better look at the palatine bone when we look at the nasal cavity. Now we'll move on to take a look at the openings in the floor of the anterior and middle cranial fossa that we saw earlier.
we'll look at three openings that pass forwards. two openings that pass downwards, and one that, in spite of appearances, passes obliquely backwards. We'll start with the ones that pass forwards. This round opening, just in front of the anterior clinoid process, is the optic canal for the optic nerve. Lateral to it, this large triangular opening is the superior orbital fissure, which we've seen already. Numerous nerves and blood vessels pass through it into the orbit. Below and behind the medial end of the superior orbital fissure, this smaller round opening, the foramen rotundum, is for the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve. We'll put this pointer in the foramen rotundum and go round to the outside. Here's the superior orbital fissure again. Here, medial to it, is the optic canal. The foramen rotundum emerges not into the orbit, but into the pterygomaxillary fissure. The two openings that pass downward are the foramen ovale, for the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve, and just behind and lateral to it, the foramen spinosum, for the middle meningeal artery. To see where those two come out, We'll go round to the underside. Here's the foramen ovale, just behind the lateral pterygoid plate. Here's the foramen spinosum, just behind and lateral to the foramen ovale. The last opening to look at is this untidy looking opening, the foramen lacerum, for the internal carotid artery. In a dry skull, the appearance of the foramen lacerum is quite misleading. It appears to pass straight down through the base of the skull, emerging here at the tip of the petrous temporal bone. In the living body, the apparent opening on the underside is filled in with dense cartilage and fibrous tissue, represented by this material. Fibrous tissue also fills in this ragged part of the internal bony opening. What's left of the foramen lacerum is a clean-cut opening through which the internal carotid artery emerges from its obliquely running bony tunnel, the carotid canal. The other end of the carotid canal, as we saw in the previous section, is back here, just medial to the styloid process. In front of the opening for the carotid canal, there's one further opening that we haven't seen yet, the opening for the auditory tube also called the eustachian tube. The auditory tube passes backwards and laterally to emerge here in the middle ear. The auditory tube is longer than this. Medially, it's prolonged by a tube of cartilage represented by this colored material. The auditory tube opens into the nasopharynx, as we'll see. We'll look at these openings again in the sections of these two tapes that deal with the blood vessels and cranial nerves. We've seen a lot of bony anatomy in this section. Let's review what we've seen of the anatomy of the facial bones and the base of the cranium. Here's the frontal bone, the zygomatic bone, the maxilla, the sphenoid bone, and the ethmoid bone. Here's the nasal bone, the lacrimal bone, and the palatine bone. Here's the orbital cavity, the orbital margin, and the opening for the nasolacrimal duct. Here's the zygomatic arch, the temporal line, the temporal fossa, and the infratemporal fossa. Here's the pterygomaxillary fissure and the inferior orbital fissure. On the sphenoid bone, here's the lesser wing, the greater wing, and the pterygoid plates, medial and lateral. Here's the pterygoid fossa 
here's the hemulus. On the inside, here's the anterior cranial fossa, the middle cranial fossa, and the posterior cranial fossa. Here's the sphenoid ridge, the cristogalli, and the cribriform plates. Here's the cella tersica, consisting of the anterior and posterior clinoid processes, the pituitary fossa, and the dorsum celli. Here's the optic canal, the superior orbital fissure, and the foramen rotundum. Here's the foramen ovale, the foramen spinosum, and the foramen lacerum. Here's the true opening of the carotid canal. Here's the opening for the auditory tube. Here's the cartilage of the auditory tube. That brings us to the end of this section on the bony anatomy of the facial skeleton and the base of the skull. In the next section, we'll move on to look at the upper part of the air passage. You'll recall that there's one important bone that we haven't yet understood, the ethmoid bone. We'll take a good look at it in the next section.